of trade. Um, we believe the base of the Democratic Party will grow through economic development, which raises the tide on all Americans. Um, and so within the Democratic Party, you're seeing fights even among the Congressional Black Caucus, um, discussions among the Democratic National Committee as to who is going to be the chair of that committee. Should we move towards a progressive, um, which saw the rise of the millennials, um, Bernie Sanders, the special interest groups in that respect? Uh, should we move back to the base of working class, blue collar, labor America, the Rust Belt uh, Americans? And shockingly to many, there was even, there is even now a discussion and an actual uh, uh, challenge to leader Nancy Pelosi who is the second longest serving leader of the Democratic Party in Congress, in the House, um, which is really a discussion about messaging and direction. Um, also a rise in terms of youth within the party who believe because Democrats rely tremendously on seniority for positions within chairmanship and ranking members, that there is no place for uh, younger members to go. So all of that is going on uh, on the Democratic side. The Republicans, and interestingly, this Freedom Caucus, which uh, previous administration and the previous Congress had acted as a foil to President Obama and the Democrats, and even the Speaker of the House, is now uh, going to become the foot soldiers, if you would, for the administration to support measures that um, President-elect Trump has promised to his base that he is going to enact. And that, in turn, means that uh, what kind of, will there be a clash? Will there be places of overlap? Will there be mechanisms in place for actual measures to take place? How will that affect Americans? How will that affect the Caribbean? Um, what has, so what we have done now is look at what has um, Mr. Trump said he would be working on in his administration. And I won't even look at the appointees, um, but what does his actual policies that he said he's going to enact, and using the appointees to determine if, in fact, that's what he's going to do. Um, infrastructure. Uh, President-elect Trump has said that he would work on a major infrastructure problem. At first blush, this would seem to be something that he and the Democratic Party would be very in sync on. The Democrats have been asking for um, an actual overhaul in terms of America's transportation systems, um, pumping billions um, of dollars into that. However, the mechanisms for the infrastructure project that uh, President-elect Trump and many within the Congress are very different. Uh, President-elect Trump has talked rather than funding projects for infrastructure, which is what the Democratic caucus has requested, he has talked about tax cuts um, for utilities and the construction sector uh, to incentivize them to do projects on their own, um, does not believe in massive funding for the project through jobs and, and other respects but to give tax breaks to developers and others, which he believes will then uh, cause for an enormous amount of increase in projects. This is something that the Democrats are not in favor of, and you will see uh, a lot of dissension in the House from the Democrats on that, and potential compromises that will need to be worked out in the Senate side, where the, uh, the vote is, uh, 51 um, to 49 in terms of uh, the party breakdown between the two. The other area, which I'm sure many of you have heard, is the repeals that President-elect Trump has said that he would do, which in conferences and discussions, um, Speaker Ryan as well as Mitch McConnell have agreed will have to be at the forefront are the repeal of the Affordable Health Care Act, um, repeal of climate change initiatives, as well as repeal and um, dismantling of some trade agreements. This, of course, will impact the Caribbean, particularly climate change. 
and some of the trade deals that have been put in place, whether that be Kafka, um, recent discussions about TPP and TPA, which doesn't have as much impact on the Caribbean, and, and other trade deals which may come down the line. Um, tax plan. Uh, President-elect Trump has said that he is very interested in doing tax reform. Just so you know, everybody says they're interested in doing tax reform, uh, but nobody actually wants to put pen and paper to it. I sit uh, on one of the caucuses that I'm a very active member on with is a group called No Labels. No Labels is a group of uh, Republicans and Democrats who try to find compromise and find areas in which we can agree on to move some legislation forward. And I sat in rooms uh, three, four, five hours with individuals from the labels, and we'll go through childcare, we'll go through um, labor issues, we'll go through everything. And when we get to tax reform, there is this enormous silence that comes over the uh, entire group. This is the most uh, detailed, um, most difficult area in Congress for members throughout the spectrum to be able to agree on. Uh, and so President-elect Donald Trump has said that this is an area that he will, in fact, be pushing. And what are the things that we believe in tax plan that might have, you might see some movement in? One would be capital gains, uh, loopholes, uh, closures, incentives for tax repatriation, is something that the president is really going to be fighting for, which um, I think there may be consensus on both sides of the aisle that work needs to be done. This will also have ramifications for the Caribbean. So looking at those top areas that the president said he would be working on in the next administration, the next four years, how will that affect the Caribbean? Um, Caribbean uh, Trump has not spoken specifically in any detail about the Caribbean. And how will that then, uh, what are we able to glean uh, in terms of how the Caribbean may affect, be affected by some of his work? So, of course, aid. Um, President Trump has repeatedly discussed the importance of developing countries, non-developing countries, of partners to pay their fair share for us not to provide um, the United States and the United States government to reduce its support to in areas of aid. Um, that aid being either in security, aid that we give to countries for security, aid for climate change, aid in development. You will see a reduction in that amount. And how will that then affect um, the relationship of states with one another when those security measures, when support and aid has been reduced. Deportation. Um, there's been enormous talk and people focus primarily on deportation uh, at the South, uh, in the Central American borders and the border states with the United States, but the deportation that is being discussed is deportation across the board. And Americans need to be very clear on this, particularly Caribbean people, of what this will mean. We know that the executive order from the president um, has been extinguished. There is deportation discussion going on he, right here in Florida with the Haitian community, how that is going to be affecting them. And so areas of DACA and others are something that there will be a tremendous amount of focus on in the first year. Um, and how is that going to affect the Caribbean nations? Uh, th those leaders are going to have to be clear about how they are going to interface with the president uh, to manage that deportation. Uh, additionally, banking issues. Uh, Mr. Pryor talked about that. There's a, a, a discussion in Washington and a tenor that all a lot of the banking that's done in the Caribbean is money laundering, is um, passing through of funds for Americans, avoiding taxes. You have seen a, a request on the part of many members of Congress to provide uh, increased restrictions on banking, banking correspondence, 
Um, there's been some constriction of banking in the Caribbean because of that. And um, that's another area that we're going to see some work on. So what can we as Caribbean people, as uh, individuals interested in the Caribbean, uh, Caribbean uh, specialists do in this area? And I think there are two levels of activity that need to take place. One that's internal to the United States. And I've been talking about this for the last year and a half to different Caribbean diaspora groups. It's the rapid organization of the Caribbean diaspora in the United States to become a much more um, politicized uh, group of individuals. In the past, uh, you know, Caribbeans make up the largest rapid uh, growth, the largest growth sector of black Americans in the United States. Uh, most conservative estimates put Caribbean Americans at about 4 million. Uh, the most generous, uh, almost at 20 million Americans are of Caribbean descent. That is a block that can have tremendous impact um, in policy and in um, how legislation is passed in Washington because those groups are concentrated in specific areas. And so that concentration allows them to then leverage that with members of Congress that represent those regions, whether that be Houston, um, Orlando, Tampa, um, the Miami area, New York City. Um, uh, there are large groups that are in Connecticut. I was shocked at that during the campaign to see the amount of Caribbean people in Hartford, Connecticut, and other areas like that. Um, Western Massachusetts, uh, and some other areas that one would not think of. So, in the past, Caribbean organizations which have been created in the United States have been cultural. They've been about maintaining culture. They've been used in slight ways as economic engines for small businesses and the communities in which they live. We now need to shift that organizational structure that they have to become political organizations, which would then allow them to leverage their numbers to be able to, uh, listen, as a member of Congress, if uh, one person calls me about an issue, uh, you know, you're going to look into it, but you're not going to feel panicked about it. If 100 people call you about it, it you will be definitely assigning a legislative assistant to work on it. If you receive 1,000 people calling you about something, you can best believe that uh, legislation is going to be introduced addressing that specific issue, and you will be looking for co-sponsors on the floor of Congress to support that initiative. And so that's an area that Caribbean Americans need to leverage. What do externally those within the Caribbean and you all need to be doing? Um, and I think that is um, rapid education. We've seen in the last elections throughout the Caribbean absolutely no <coughs> regimes coming into power. Those individuals are coming to Washington with a clean slate, but also with very little networks in place. Um, when regimes change, uh, quite often in the Caribbean, they will receive transition books. There may be career people that are in the offices uh, that they're taking over, but there are not the relationships. And so these uh, new heads of state and their representatives of Washington and New York need to better leverage the individuals that are in policy positions, whether they be in State Department, whether they be in Congress. Um, there are, in this new Congress, quite a number of Caribbean diaspora members of Congress. Myself, of course, who I will be probably the co-chair of the Caribbean Caucus. You have Yvette Clark of New York. Um, you have Mia Love on the Republican side, who's of uh, Haitian descent in Utah. You now have um, my sister Jennifer, who's the new um, resident commissioner from Puerto Rico, who's also a Republican. Um, Anthony Brown of uh, Maryland. Um, Frederica Wilson uh, here in, in um, Florida. Sheila Jackson Lee in Houston. Um, Carlos Corbello, you have the whole Cuban contingent that is also here in Florida. You have Kamala Harris, 
who is in the Senate. So these represent uh, individuals in Congress who are ideologically and culturally and ethnically focused on